Welcome to If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo podcast with Don Purdy, former member of the Buffalo Bills front office, 27 years, and Josh Cormier, a member of the coaching staff under the Wade Phillips regime. And we are here, as always, to talk with you about the Buffalo Bills of 1990 and, of course, 2022. This episode is brought to you by TSE Buffalo and Armstrong's Barbershop. We're going to get right into the interview with Luke Russert. We are joined by Luke Russert, a contributor on several national media programs, including NBC, ESPN, XM Satellite Radio. In 2014, he penned an introduction dedicated to his father for the 10th anniversary um, of his father's best-selling book, Big Russ and Me. Most importantly, Luke, who serves as an unofficial national ambassador for his hometown, Western New York region. And that includes, of course, his passionate fanship of the Buffalo Bills. We, uh, in our research, we ran across this amazing quote from Luke. He said in 2013, I honestly think being a Bills fan is something that's passed down into your blood. My grandfather was a diehard Bills fan and he passed it on to my dad. I was given a Buffalo Bills jersey when I was probably two years old. So there's never really any doubt that I'd be a Bills fan. Luke, how you doing today? I'm great, and it was nice to enjoy a Sunday without the stress of the Bills after that uh, come-from-behind victory on Thanksgiving. So it's uh, it doing well. It's yeah, victory, we actually commented on Monday. that. Yeah, I commented on that this morning. It's nice when they win on a Thursday, and then you can just root against all the other AFC teams, you know, kind of stress-free on a Sunday. It was a lot of fun. I did that. It was great to see Jacksonville beat Baltimore. And uh, although I guess the Bucks beating Cleveland would have helped us, it's always nice to see Brady lose. So that was Fair. a great time. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter at all for the standings. It's just what you said. It's just the right. standings. Uh, <laughs> yeah, where are you calling from, Luke? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm Washington D.C. is where I'm. I'm home. Was my home base, and so yeah. I've mean, you know, been here uh, most of my life. But obviously, I have a very strong connection to Buffalo and. What's interesting about the D.C. region is that we have uh, over four official Bills backer bars because there's so many Buffalo expats. Uh, and and I got really into that in like the last 10 years is there's been a few great ones, one called Exiles uh, that's run by a Canisius guy. There's one called Grand Central that's run by a Timon guy. So there's some there's some good Buffalo fandom in the D.C. area. Uh, so you're never really too far away. And then ample supply of Labatt Blue Light. Uh, there you go. I, w- I actually went to one of them, whatever the one that's called, right near the uh, right near the, the, the stadium where the Capitals or the arena. Oh, the yeah. that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the uh, – uh, oh, God, what's the, the name of that place? It used to be Laughing Man's Tavern. Now it's a new one. But that's a good one. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's like three stories. And, 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 yeah. my wife and I were going to visit my family who live in Arlington. And uh, – uh-huh. We went in 2019 to a game. That was a lot of fun. It's uh, the, the 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 Bills backers bar guys, like the out of town guys, are in some ways even more passionate. When you go to a when you go to a Bills backers bar, um, those guys are really passionate, and it's almost yeah. more. F- I I prefer to watch a game out of town than even at a bar here. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with you because I think it's a weekly sort of Buffalo <laughs> festival slash reunion, and the people who obviously have moved away from Buffalo, they still hold on to that identity so strongly. And that's what I really just enjoyed about the Bills Beckers bars is that, you know, for two hours or three hours every weekend, it's like you're at a, at a bar in South Buffalo or Cheektowaga. And it's, you know, you got all the delicacies, the wings and beef on weck and the black blue, you get the sponge cake. Uh, it's just a, it, it's a wonderful time. And I've, I've gone to them in Los Angeles. I've gone to them in Chicago and New York and in South Florida. And it, it, it's just, the, the, there's not a single bad one across the country. I mean, all of them go all out every single weekend during the season. It's phenomenal. Yeah, we had, we had Bob Matthews on who, who has a Bills Backers bar uh, in West Palm Beach Oh uh, yeah, on our show. And Brendan's. he said, Brendan's, Brendan's. In, in West Palm Beach. And he uh-huh. actually said that they've had a couple of uh, marriages come from ah! people who, who uh, I, have you ever heard of any of those, Lou? <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, you got to think for one of the things that I always think is funny when you're a Bills fan, especially if you're a diehard one, you know, whoever you end up with, you basically have to say uh, that time on Sunday is very sacred to me. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be an absolute maniac uh, for that <laughs> amount of time. And what happens on the field can affect me for up, upwards of 48 to 72 hours or for many, many years after. So just, just be able to deal with that. 
Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting because some folks will say to me, like, oh, well, you must have enjoyed that game. I said, well, it's not really enjoyable during it. No. When we win, no. it is very enjoyable. Exactly. Uh, but, like, the Kansas City game was a great example. I got all these congratulatory texts, and I said, yeah, well, that wasn't that uh, – it wasn't enjoyable until the interception at the end. And then the same thing with Minnesota. When we stopped him at the goal line, I started getting all the texts. And I, as a Bills fan, I said, it's not over yet. No, it's not, not over yet, Absolutely. please. Uh, and then you see what happens. So that's just part of being a Bills fan is it's never easy, uh, but it makes it all the sweeter when we finally get there. That's right. So so going way back, when, when did, at what age did your Bills fanship kick in? So I actually remember uh, the, the first Super Bowl wide right uh, as a young, young kid. My father had gone out to watch the game in D.C. with some friends of his, some, some Buffalo Bills backers. And I wasn't allowed to go. I had to go to bed. But I just remember him being very upset for a few days after the fact and watching that highlight uh, routinely. And then the next year when they played Washington in the Super Bowl, that was obviously very big because I was the only kid at school that had Bill's gear on. Everybody else had Washington gear on. So I was sort of an outcast and an outlier. But I enjoyed it. And we watched that game actually uh, in Buffalo. And I remember that one distinctly because I think a lot of folks felt that that team was going was gonna to win. Uh, just after what happened the year before, it was sort of that redemptive arc. And then we went to the two Super Bowl, the one in Southern California at the Rose Bowl against Dallas and the one in Atlanta uh, against Dallas. The last one with my uh, my late uncle Bill and my grandfather, Big Russ. And I just yeah, I, I thought at halftime when we were up 13-9, the fourth one that we really had a chance. I remember that one the best because I was the oldest at the time. Um so those are really ingrained in me. And then obviously watching the games with my father every weekend in D.C. I mean, in the early 90s when DSS Direct TV came out, it was still a kind of a new thing. And no one really knew how to install it. And my father was literally calling up numbers in the phone book to try and find someone that could install the satellite dish so he could watch the bills at home. And ended up finding some guy in Baltimore to be able to do it. So, uh yeah, it's just sort of synonymous with Sunday afternoons and my father and watching the games. And then we would, all, we would go to a game every now and then in Orchard Park. And then my father used to like to try and see him when they played in the area, whether it was in Washington or Baltimore. And sometimes we'd see games in uh, in New Jersey when we were up in that, uh, that neck of the woods. And then I went to Boston College, and so I would always see those Bills-Pats games. Unfortunately, back then, mm. it was uh, – you know, Shane Matthews against Tom Brady, so it wasn't the most fair <laughs> fight. But <laughs> I had a good time. I had a good time, and it instilled a deep, deep dis- disgust with New England. And I remember, I remember Shane Matthews came, and I handled Bill's pay. And I think he came from the Bears. And I remember him saying, you guys don't have direct deposit? And I said, I'll look into it. And we ended up getting direct deposit because of him. There's just a random. Random Shane Matthews. Matthews. Yeah, right? <laughs> and then Chris Berman, Shane Matthews band. Yeah. So that oh, was, yeah. That's, that's, that's right. Fun. Do you uh, do you remember, Luke, do you remember your first Bills game in Orchard Park? How old were you? Like, what was your impression of, you know. I was thinking year? about that. Yeah, it was definitely, it, I think it was the last year of the Jim Kelly era. Uh, and I remember just going with my father and my uncles. And uh, I just remember how loud it was because the stadium then was just so packed. I mean, it's, it is now, but it just felt like there were many more people back then. Uh, it just was sort of the old layout. Uh, and I just remember those teams, you know, between Thurman and Andre Reed and Jim Kelly. And there was just this confidence uh, with those squads, especially after all that they had accomplished. And they were so synonymous with the town. Uh, and it, to me, the most, the, the, the most enduring memory was just how good they were. I mean, I think people forget that because everyone is in tags, the, the four Super Bowl losses on them. And I was very fortunate to be a part of the Four Falls of Buffalo documentary, ESPN 30 for 30, uh, a, few, a few years back and worked in the production of that. And when you actually go back through those seasons and you see the dominance of, of, the, of that 90s team, that 90s era team, uh, if they had won one Super Bowl, people would talk about them, you know, a la kind of like the Steelers in the 70s. I mean, that's how good they were for such a prolonged period. Uh, and I just remember the city feeling that, oozing that. I mean, there is just such a wonderful confidence in that team and what they were able to accomplish. And it was evident at the stadium in, uh, in the first time I went. Yeah, I'll tell you, Luke, that was a tremendous production. I didn't realize till <clears throat> just recently we were doing some more homework on you. 
that you were part of the production team of that. We had Steve Tasker on last week, and I told him that I just loved his role in that documentary because he had a way of kind of summarizing what other guys, the sentiment of what other guys said. And uh, he, he loved it too. One of the, maybe his frustrations with it was that most Bills fans, however you want to quantify that, have watched it and enjoyed it and appreciated it. But there's still some holdouts that don't know if they can, that if they can just handle reliving it. Yeah, it's funny because when we were working on it, uh, one of the things that came to light, which I was really surprised by, was that Thurman and Bruce and Jim Kelly and I believe Andre had never watched any of the tape of the Super Bowls. Wow. And I was floored by that because in my own mind, I'm kind of thinking like, oh, these are these are Hall of Fame athletes. They wouldn't want to just sort of see what went wrong, what didn't sort of go through the tape. But I think there was really a mentality of, well, that was the last game of the season. We just got to move forward. Uh, let's 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 pick it up and try again, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it, right? It's like, hey, we got it. Let's wipe the slate clean. We don't want to be bogged down by bad memories. Let's let's go forward. But we were able actually to convince uh, Thurman and Bruce to watch those Super Bowls again uh, on camera, and it was fascinating. Unfortunately, I was not in the room for it. I wish I was, but it was from my friends who were working on it who spoke to me. It was just sort of a cathartic moment for them to a degree. It was obviously painful. Uh, but to be able to sort of see it and relive it and know, hey, you came really close. And by the way, you did a hell of a job. And I think the best part about that uh, Four Falls of Buffalo was the outside voices away from Buffalo. So Troy Aikman, for example, says on tape what the Bills did going to four in a row. Honest to God, is harder than what we did, uh, <laughs> you know, winning three in four years. It's, it's so difficult to do it. Uh, and, and what they were able to put through with that sustained success, which not many franchises are able to do. So if anything, I think folks watching that, you can't, if you're, if you're being an honest viewer, you can't watch that and then be like, oh, this team's a failure. Because they're not. They're not a failure. Is they just, they, they ran into some very good teams in the NFC. There was a huge imbalance back then, if you recall. The yeah. NFC was loads better than the AFC. And by the way, the road to the Super Bowl, they went through hell and high water and made it for those four years. So they deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, and look, I, I, if you go back and watch it again, I think you wish we had the first one and maybe you wish we had the last one. The two in the middle were, were, were tough. They were yeah, tough. Yeah, they yeah, were tough. I, I was there, you know, at all four Super Bowls. And I remember yeah. the post-game party after Super Bowl twenty five. If if someone came to the party and didn't know who won or lost, you easily could have thought the Bills won. We just yeah. it was so much fun. The, the, la the three after that were, were like funerals. They, they were tough. But the first one, it was yeah. just like everyone knew we were going to go back, and, and we did. Uh, one, a couple other things. We watched uh, your interview with Rich Eisen about uh, the four falls of Buffalo. You talked about Don Beebe. He, not you, mentioned that Beebe was the only Bill to – uh, win a Super Bowl afterwards. But we had Mike Lodish on a few weeks ago who would want to remind the football world that he actually did win <laughs> a couple Super Bowls. But it, it's funny, his overall sentiment, and it still is if you follow him on social media, he, he's way more attached to the Bills than he is the Broncos. Yes. Who he won to win. Would you agree? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think that it, it, it's amazing, again, that which the point you bring up there is if you look at sort of the players who – had an impact in Buffalo or spent some serious time there, and then they go on and find success somewhere else. Most all of them look so glowingly upon Buffalo still. I mean, Marshawn Lynch is a great example of that, right? I mean, here's a guy, and he didn't have the best time in Buffalo off the field, but was sort of greeted, came back and greeted and, and beloved. Uh, and you see a lot of that. You know, Lee Evans is another good example of that. Uh, there's just so many guys that it's even, even if they're there for a cup of coffee, it means so much. I, I, I agreed with the people who were a little leery of, of watching that that show. And then funny enough, that it, the ESPN premiere, I remember it was December 9th, 2015. The reason I remember that so specifically is because my 40th birthday was the next day, mm. December 10th, 2015. <laughs> and, and full disclosure, Luke, I got drunk to watch the Four Falls of Buffalo because I, like, I was like, oh man, I, 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 was, I, I knew it was going to be great. I wanted to watch it, but I was just a little leery. I'm like, oh man, I've never watched the Super Bowls, 
you know, I, I never watched them. So I just was leery of, of, of reliving it and whatever else. But about 20 minutes in, you know, I'm already kind of crying. <laughs> and, yeah. and, 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 and it did, it was, it was cathartic. And this is just for somebody, you know, like me. So I can only imagine for the players, my one question that comes from what you said, did the guys like sit down and watch all four of the Super Bowls, like with, with the producers and, and the guys on the crew? Yeah, from my understanding of it, and I, I, I don't, I don't know that I don't remember the details explicitly. But from my understanding of it, was that uh, Bruce and Thurman did watch all four of them, and I think that Jim watched parts of them, um, and Andre as well. So they they definitely watched more than they had in in quite a long time. Uh, it's it's interesting though because I kind of I'm on your side in the sense of the more recent trauma. I can't watch it, so I you know I can't I can't watch thirteen seconds. You know that, if that comes on the TV, I have to turn it off or or move on. And I've just sort of reached my peace with the forward lateral in in Tennessee. Oh, no. You know, no, no. where I can. No, that, I was that's that I was I was on the coaching staff with under Wade Phillips. Yeah, and I remember I remember watching that for the first. So so Coach Phillips wouldn't watch that, and then when. Unfortunately, we played tennis. We, we played Tennessee Week One in two thousand. That Sunday night game. Yeah, I remember that. Well, the revenge game, ESPN, and the first, the very first team meeting for the two thousand season. Did the full, you know, after after cutdowns, all that. He played that mm -hmm. the Music City Miracle, and 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 it was silent in there, and it was the first time that he had watched it. And he starts just in, in, in Coach Phillips was the most mild mannered, and he starts just cursing at 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 the, at the board, just cursing yeah. at the board. And so yeah, I, I mean you're right, Luke. Like like I know a lot of people now here. Thirteen seconds, you just you flip the channel. You just absolutely you have flip to, them. yeah. And, and and it was easier to do back then in the Super Bowl years before you know obviously social mm -hmm. media whatever. I wouldn't turn the TV on for two or three days after the Super Bowl losses, right? Yeah. No, no, no. It, it was yeah. tough. And I remember going back to the Four Falls, uh, I remember Bruce, I think they may have watched all four, but they really focused on Super Bowl Twenty Five. And you watched him watch himself sacking Hostetler, but having his hand on Hostetler's wrist that had the football, and he's like, how did he hold on to that ball? So it, it was two mm -hmm. points where it should have, you know, could have been seven and no, and they did the same thing happened when the the Super Bowl against Washington, where the, the famous forgotten helmet, and uh, they show the backup. I forget his name off the top of my head, missing the hole. And Thurman is like, "If I was in there, I guarantee you, I would have hit the hole, scored a oh. touchdown, the first drive of the game, and you know, things could have been different." And you, you get a lot of that. I, I mo the most recent stuff, though, thirteen seconds. The thing I sort of hold on to is the perfect game that Josh Allen pitched against New England, which is extraordinary. And the one thing that I always just put in people, because, you know, a lot of people will rib me about it. There's no guarantee you get past Cincinnati with how good Cincinnati was towards the end of the season last year. Uh -huh. And Kansas City proved that, right? Yep. So there is, some, there is a, some saving grace that they lost to Cincinnati the next week. And the idea of that, okay, both teams were so emotionally spent, could they have come back and actually won another game? I don't know. I don't know. But it uh, makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> there was some very angry. Uh, my wife, who, who is a is a very passionate and and Bills fan, at halftime of that Chiefs Bengals game, it was just head shaking. I can't believe we'd be at home for this game, and they were up twenty one yeah. to three or whatever the Chiefs were. And it was I almost like left the house and took a walk around the block because <laughs> I was so angry, and she was so angry, yeah. and and yeah. So so Luke, like, do you have do you have a favorite Bills game? Maybe other than you know the ones that everybody knows, or or kind of an off the radar favorite Bills player. Oh, an off the radar favorite Bills player. Um, gosh, you know who I really liked growing up was remember Jay Reimersma. Oh yeah, tight end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michigan. I, yeah Michigan guy. I always mm -hmm. thought that he was a really solid uh, player. Sort of grew up rooting for him. Uh, love Daryl Talley with the Spider Man spandex, but he's sort of you know he's more mainstream with the Bills. Obviously, love Doug Flutie um, with how he played, and then going on to to BC. Uh, in the more recent years, you know, I was I have a tweet to prove this. When they drafted Milano, I was ecstatic because I had watched him so much in college. And I was like, this guy's going to be very solid and very good. Now, I did not think he'd be arguably the best linebacker in the league, 
right? Uh, but he is someone who I just am, am, am a huge, huge, huge fan, and I hope he stays in Buffalo his entire career because I really think that he could be on the wall of fame I, I uh, with, with how good he's been playing and, and the sustained yeah. success. Um, let me just say going back further a little bit, uh, I liked Lee Evans a fair amount. I thought he was good and peerless price in, in those years because those guys I thought were just so, so talented. And uh, I liked Stevie Johnson because, <laughs> yeah. you know, that one of the seasons that I go back to was the 2010 season, which we were four and 12. And if you remember that season, it was the, where Stevie dropped the ball and asked God why it happened right? yeah. <laughs> on social media. Yeah. Yeah. But that season for me in terms of Bill's fandom, because I watched all the games at Bill's Backer Bars, and if you go back and look at that season, they played their ass off in every game. And it was one of those seasons where it really was a sort of testament to, okay, we might not be the best team. We might not have the talent, but we're going to go out there and literally leave it all on the field. And that season, I had always been a believer, but that made me a very big, big time believer. Because I was like, these guys, that team understood who they were in the community. And then obviously the next year they come back and they beat New England in that incredible comeback where they actually brought down the goalposts, which I still think is hysterical, fearing that people were going to rush the field of an NFL game. <laughs> Look good at that game, yeah. That, yeah. That was, that was a long but time. yeah, so it, it, it's uh, yeah, it's just memories like that and uh, Fitz Magic and what well, that was like too. Well, yeah, good so. memories of, of you know a, a tough, obviously tough years for the Bills, but guys who did really uh, you know stand out. I remember when Stevie you know said, "Why did God let that happen?" And um, I didn't know what to say. I felt for some reason I felt um, I don't know why I thought I had any good words for him, but I, I dropped him a letter in the off season. I said. I've learned from my life. Sometimes God just says no because He knows better. <laughs> than, better for whatever reason, you'll find out later that you know maybe it helped you become a better player. Who, who knows? But um, you, before we started recording uh, here, Luke, um, yeah. you mentioned Scott Birchstall. What, what, what the what? What can you tell us about your uh, friendship and and knowing Scott? Well, Scott has always been extremely kind to me, and uh, he and my father were very close. And every single season, he would send us the Buffalo Bills yearbook. He would send us an early copy of the schedule because it was pre-internet days, right? He would actually have it on paper earlier on. Not all the times were filled in, but that was very neat and cool. And he usually sends a sort of Bills memento. And I got to know Scott uh, very well as I got older and – he was just, you know, just to me, someone synonymous with, with the Bills and very highly respected in the league. But the story I was telling you guys is I did an event uh, in Chautauqua with Roger Goodell a number of years ago. And Goodell is obviously, as we know, a Jamestown guy. Uh, gets back to Western New York every now and then, especially in Chautauqua. And Goodell said, I love Scott Birchtold because he's literally my body double. <laughs> uh, he's my stunt double. And I go to events and people think that he is me and allows me to escape or not have to deal with difficult questions. So I loved having Scott around and I would always try to make sure he was there for those Super Bowls because it took some heat off of me. <laughs> And if you look about 10 or 15 yards away on a crowded football field, two tall ginger guys, I think Scott Burchell does a pretty good Roger Goodell impersonation. Well, hey, that, that's how you know you've really made it, Luke, is when you have a, <laughs> you know, a body double. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, right. Um, uh, let me, Buffalo, you know, Buffalo is a small town. I'm looking at my phone because I got a text before this I want to I wanna read to you uh, from a friend of mine. He actually co-wrote the, the book I wrote about the October storm. Mm -hmm. But uh, Billy Clune uh, recalls. Okay, let me ask you this. This I'm sure some of the questions we've asked you so far you can anticipate. No way you could anticipate this one. <laughs> he he thinks that he might have worn the same lion costume as a child for Halloween because he knew your aunt who worked with his your mom at Gold Dome Bank and lent him the lion costume that you wore on Halloween once. That I don't would be mine, but that way uh, it's really that? that may have been my cousin, but that's Maybe because so. my aunt my aunt works at the banks. So that's probably my cousin. Uh okay. he, yeah, Jesse. That'd probably be my cousin Jesse's lion costume. But yeah, yeah that's definitely possible. Aunt Kiki yeah. worked at banks for a number of years. So yeah. That's that, yeah, that that's that's real inside baseball. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you you couldn't have seen that one. You couldn't have seen that one. I, I have kind of one as well. Uh, I told I told my friend 
that you know you were going to be on the program and his dad uh was Canisius High School and he oh, went yeah. to school with your dad and he said you know he ended up becoming the deputy mayor of Buffalo under Jimmy Griffin for 12 years named Sam Arachi and he said that what he knew about you is and, and I did not know this you were named after Luke Easter the, the Bison's legend is that right that, that is correct so uh there's sort of there, the the name origin has three threads. So one of them is the biblical one, St. Luke, which, you know, if my father was talking to a nun or something, he would say that. Okay. Then yeah. the other thread is Cool Hand Luke for Paul Newman. Nice. Uh, it's my father's favorite movie. But the real one is Luke Easter, who was just an incredible uh, ball player uh, for for the Bisons. And then I uh, did, did some time with the Cleveland Indians uh, call up in the American League. Sadly, passed away when he was a he worked after retire in his retirement as a bank guard and was killed in a robbery. Mm. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, about the Luke Easter uh, uh, namesake because I've now started to collect little bits of Luke Easter memorabilia. So I have some of the baseball cards. And then somebody heard about this in Buffalo and actually sent me a a home run ball that Luke Easter had hit out of the park right. and said that he had gotten as a little kid. He was out there in, in right field or whatever and, and it picked it up. And so I have that memento, which is very cool. But yeah, there is a there 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 is a big Luke Easter poster in my father's uh, office back in in DC that, that I, I now have, which is uh, which is it's it's great to have. It's great to that's, have. Uh, that's that's a great story. Uh, a couple more before we we let you go here. Sure. Can you share with us a story that maybe people don't know about your dad and the Bills? Do you have something that comes to mind that maybe you know hasn't hasn't you know gone public before, or you know a favorite memory that you have of him maybe watching a game with you guys? How was he as a fan? Was he loud, boisterous? Was he quiet? How was he as a fan? I think it depended on the game and it depended on the season. Uh, if there, it, if it was a season where they were expected to have success and where he thought they could really make a run in the playoffs, uh, that would be something where he would get you know very loud and and very much into it. If it was a season where there, excuse me, the expectations weren't particularly high, then he wouldn't get too aggravated so i think he sort of went up and down with that um the time you know because he passed in 08 so those last few seasons around there were kind of in the beginning of of the drought and not particularly good but if you do recall i think it was in 2004 or 5 whatever year it was that Bill Cowher was basically trying to gift us a playoff berth by playing the Steelers backups. And all we had to do was win the last game. What year was that? Was that 04? 04. 04. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I watched that game with my father and he went absolutely ballistic, uh, mainly because he knew that Cowher was trying to do, uh, who was the coach? Was it Williams? Uh, or no, it was um, Malarkey. It was Malarkey. Matt Malarkey. Right. Because Malarkey used to work for him. Right. Sorry. So he was trying to do malarkey a solid, basically like, hey, get into the playoffs. You know, we're, our seed's all good, blah, blah. And he just goes, we can't beat the second stringers to go to the playoffs. Like, ah! <laughs> Willie, Willie Parker was a running – he was like the third – He ran all over us that game. He had a, yeah. a coming out party. Yeah, that was a frustrating game. Yeah. But it, it does, so that was one I I, I remember. But in but in all honesty, which was so great, is my father was very busy. He had a, a lot going on, obviously. But the Bills games were always the special time where the outside world was sort of turned off. The focus was squarely on the football and love of Buffalo uh, and the team. And he watched every single game. Uh, I like to think that if he was alive now with the way you can sort of pick it up on your phone, what that would have been like for him <laughs> to sort of see the stats instantaneously and, and whatnot. Uh, but it, it wasn't sort of I, – I remember some guy wrote uh, kind of a pot shot a few years ago. Like, well, you know, kind of Tim Russert had this Buffalo Bills, you know, fandom that he sort of used as a brand. And I wrote, oh, I wrote to the guy – I wrote to the guys like – no, it's not a brand, okay? It's not a brand at all. It was literally a way of life. And uh, this is not a guy who would pick up a hat and put it on and you know take a picture with it and be like, oh, yeah, I'm a diehard fan, which you see a lot of politicians do. Uh, and I grew up a lot, around a lot of politicians. And one of the things that politicians are really good at is being phonies. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> so my father was absolutely. an absolute true diehard fan of the team who followed them religiously uh, and would have acted the same way had he been on Meet the Press or had he did something else or, or been in the sanitation department like my grandfather. So that was a real, truly authentic uh, vibe. And yeah, he, 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 I think one thing that other folks don't get is that you know he really took the losses uh, hard, kind of like how we do. Um, and one of the things that he sort of passed on to me is I don't really like watching games with anyone who's not a Bills fan. Yeah. Like I can't really watch a Bills game casually. Now, if they're, you know, if they're, look, if they're two and 14 or something, then yeah, okay, I'm not going to freak out too much. But in these last few years when they're good and the expectations are high, like a friend of mine's like, oh, you know, I, I'm a Patriots fan. We should watch a game with the game on Thursday together. I go, hell no, I'm not going to watch it with you. <laughs> is, is this, is, is Thursday night like your personal regular season Super Bowl, like at New England? That's got to be like the game that you want to win. I, I, yeah, it's one I really want. It's okay. one I really want, but I, I gotta, I gotta say, I think this is a very odd year for us because. So I mean, if to answer your questions, like that's what was really something I don't think people knew about my father is that he was so passionate about it that he did not want to be, you know, he, he couldn't do it casually. Now for me, I think this year, uh, I really want the win at New England, but it, you know, it's interesting that the division's alive again because it brings back those memories of the '90s where Miami was so hated. Yeah. And I try to tell people that the 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 hatred towards New England is relatively new. Obviously, now it's probably almost what 18, 20 years old. But in the nineties, it really was the Dolphins. I mean, that was the game, right? Yeah, and Marino and Kelly and and all of that. And Brian I'm happy Cox. That, yeah, yeah, Brian Cox giving us the finger, and then it's great that his son comes and plays yeah, for us for a year. Yeah, New um, England, the rivalry. I don't know. It's, it was the hammer and the nail. You can't, it's hard to call that a rivalry. And the Bills and the Dolphins. We're, you know, well, we were on the winning end. I think Marv and Jim were like uh, 17 and five or something crazy against Shula and Marino, but still they had such important games and we're battling it out in the standings. It was always almost, it seemed, for the division. And yeah, uh, yeah so I really want to, I want to beat New England, but I also want to beat Miami. And I, I just look at this schedule and I, I got to, I thought the beginning of this year was such a gauntlet. Right. Yeah. So you start out in L.A. for the Super Bowl banner. Then you have Monday night against Tennessee. Then you have Kansas City and Pittsburgh and Baltimore and Miami. And it's just like, OK, I was uh, perhaps naively under the impression that once we got through Green Bay, we could have a breather <laughs> of a little bit. But no, it seems like it's getting harder. And injuries. Yeah. And the injuries have also uh, have have continued. And that's that's really a shame. And that's something which I don't think the national media is knowledgeable enough about for our team, especially with Micah Hyde being out for the season. But if you look at there's th this year, um, I'm of the opinion because I, I went to the game in Baltimore is that I think we should have beat Miami. I think that was just 180 degrees. Josh threw one in the ground right at the end, which we would have won the game. I actually think that we got really lucky in Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was the game that he probably should have lost. Yeah. So I sort of those two cancel out. But then the other losses are, are kind of fluky, you yep. know? Yep. And it's like you're not that far from just being a one-loss team or even undefeated. And that's one of the things where people were very pessimistic this season. I go, hey, this team has not been – blown out once this year uh we have not had a, a version like the colts game last year no they've lost uh, three, three games yeah. by eight points and they're the only team to they've, they've beaten all three other afc division leaders correct and i actually i actually for the first time in my life went viral two weeks ago luke and you'll, you'll appreciate this i put out a tweet on our you know if the walls could talk in pod uh, in buffalo podcast and i and i said i thought after the jets game i said that'll be the bill's last loss until 2023, unless they rest their starters in week 18. <clears throat> and luckily, Old Takes Exposed found me uh, the <laughs> week after when we lost to Minnesota. And within four minutes of that game ending, I had already had like 125 likes. And these were <laughs> likes in air quotes. And I had a lot of new <laughs> friends in Miami and in, in Philadelphia and in New England who were telling me all about my knowledge of football, and et cetera. So I'm with you. Like I, I so what I, I actually retweeted and I said, well, okay, the Minnesota game will be the last, you know, loss of the season. Cause I think, I think they still have the potential to run the table. here. I really do. Yeah. I think that 
you obviously have to see where their depth is. And I'm very happy they brought in John Brown back. We'll see what he can do. But I feel like the John Brown sort of Cole Beasley is the position that's been missing, yeah. giving Josh that sort of security blanket, especially uh, on third down. Um, I hope the run game continues to be bolstered because I think it can be successful and it just helps relieve so much pressure on Josh when that gets going. And obviously with the D, you hope that Trey White comes back and, and they continue to sort of focus on a run defense. But uh, I, I agree. I think this sort of woe is me pessimism uh, is, is kind of crazy. I mean, remember last year, what, we were at six and five at one point? Seven, right? and, six. seven and six. Yep. Or seven and six. So, and, and you saw how they turned it on towards the end and closed strong. And there's always been, what I think is interesting about this team, they kind of they, they kind of toy with their opponents in the beginning. Uh, you know, the Tennessee game is not, ref- the score is not reflective of how tight it was in the beginning. I remember last year against Atlanta, late in the season, Atlanta was kind of giving them bits at home, and then they sort of turned it on, right? But there's just sort of an element of that where, not every game is going to be you know, the Steelers' massive blowout, right? And you, we have to we have to understand that, but also understand that they're built very well, and they're built to win, and they're built to win now. And the goal is you want to win the division. The goal is you want the number one seed. But the Buffalo Bills, the playoffs, are not a team that anyone wants to face. Right. And, and, and you see there's a lot of casual Bills fans now, I think, that have hopped on the bandwagon the last couple of years. And yeah. those people aren't used to, you know, losing a regular season game. And there's a lot of, like, that freak out mode. <laughs> like, if they don't, they don't, you know, if they don't win by 20, it's like, okay, yeah, this is the NFL. Like, a win, you know, a win is a win is a cliche, but it's true. It it's, is. Hard to win. it's hard to win in the NFL. It's really hard. And the people who are expecting 16 and one and to cruise to the Super Bowl, you know, sorry, that's just not the way it works. No, and look at and look at the last few Super Bowl winners. I mean, they've all had difficult lulls in their season. The Rams are a great example last year, right? Like, and then Tampa Bay, even Kansas City, when they were on that on that march, they had a little bit of a lull there. So it it it's part of the modern day NFL. It's part of the 17 game schedule. It's part of the expanded playoffs. It's it's hard. It's not easy. But you think about all they've had to endure, if they could just get a little bit healthy. Uh, it, 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 I was at the game in L.A. for the season uh, kickoff. Okay. And that team was so good. Yeah, they were right? scary good. They were scary They good. were so good. And it's just, if you could just get some, obviously hides out, but just somewhat close to that opening day roster, oh, it would be, it would be great. We're we're gonna let you go here, Luke. But we uh, we do something called the two minute warning, where okay. we ask you as many questions as we can in two minutes. Sure, and you answer them. You know, however you want. So we're gonna start the clock. If and you see us looking up. It's yeah. We have we have a, we have a real we have a a, yeah, L, you know, a handwritten board. And there's no LED or this is not this is not fancy. <laughs> so, so we're gonna start the clock, and Don is gonna is gonna fire the first one. All right, we can alternate. Yeah, go. Okay, here we go. Um, you might have already answered this for real. Most interesting place to watch a Bills game? Uh, Bills, backer, bars. Three people, dead or alive, that you'd want to have dinner with? Uh, oh, by the way, I should back to that old question, the last question you used to ask me. I actually watched the Bills-Cowboys Thanksgiving game in Amon Jordan and found a Bills oh. fan in Amon Jordan. So that Beautiful. was very cool. So I will say that's the most interesting one ever. That's a, that's Three a people, game. dead or alive. Uh, <laughs> let's go with uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, and uh, I guess I, I guess Julius Caesar. We'll go history. Nice. Yeah, nice. big big time. There you go. Uh, you're entering a room with dry ice. Grand entrance. What song do you want playing? Oh, uh, uh, Badlands. Bruce Springsteen. Like it. Best concert. Oh, Springsteen. There you go. I've been to I've been to north of sixty. Wow. 60. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Back here in Buffalo, your favorite favorite restaurant and what dish would you have? Oh, favorite restaurant. Um, I would go with so if we're gonna be, you know, if we're giving love to South Buffalo, the 911 Tavern and their wings are so good, right? So I'll throw that out there. Uh, but I really like tempo and the pasta there. So nice. the bolognese at tempo is really good. Good place. Uh, favorite cartoon as a kid. Uh, the Simpsons, but my parents didn't like that I watched it, so I had to hide it. <laughs> okay. Uh, four more. We're going to fit them in. All right. Yeah. Back to the food. A popular food that you hate. Popular food that I hate. Um, 
Yeah, man, I, I eat everything. That's my <laughs> problem. Uh, popular food that I hate, let's yeah, stuffing. I don't like stuffing. That just came up for Thanksgiving. Okay, so there, there you go. go. Most annoying fan of another NFL team in either politics or media? Oh, God. I mean, just every single New England fan. <laughs> I mean, they're just uh, – I, I would say the people that – are just and this is uh, it, there's no specific one because there's just so many but the people that idolize brady to this insanity where they try to canonize him and they don't admit this all the breaks that have come around for him I mean, look what he did is extraordinary but if you if you pull back we don't know how many of those were affected by cheating we don't know how many of those were uh, it, it just, you know, Kyle Shanahan not being able to call play in the second okay. half, not giving the ball to Marshawn Lynch. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors there. So the, the Brady stands out there are just absolutely brutal. Oh, that's great. Uh, can you drive a stick shift? No. Mm. And that's actually funny. I have a book coming out May 2nd, which is a travel memoir, which uh, I write about leaving NBC and going to travel around the world for about two and a half years. And one of the things that comes up is I was in Uruguay with my mother and we get this rental car and it doesn't, it's in stick and it's not an automatic. And she questions my manhood for why I cannot drive. <laughs> we were doing <laughs> that. <not> pretty pathetic. <laughs> so I actually, I, I should learn how to do that. And it's also, you know, you, I always peruse those sort of like old car websites because I want to get one of those beat up old Broncos from the seventies or eighties and they, all of them are in stick. So I'm like, all right, I gotta, I gotta learn how to do that to save, uh, to save some money. <laughs> two, two more. Is there is there somebody in, in politics or in the media that would surprise everyone at, that they are a Bills fan, other than Wolf Blitzer? Um, not a Bills fan, but here's one that I will tell you, which a lot of people don't get. So I covered the House of Representatives for a number of years, and Nancy Pelosi is actually a diehard sports fan. Okay, and wow. knows a lot about the Niners and the Warriors and the Giants, and watches Sports Center all day. So if you would go into her office. Uh, it's just, it would be sports center be on the TV and running on the highlights. And I asked her, I said, why do you, she's like, well, I like sports because there's a winner and a loser. Oh, uh, and you know, and, you know everything else yeah. is just sort of hyperbole. So yeah, that's something that I think a lot of people would never believe is that Nancy Pelosi's a real wow. sports fan. Yeah. Yeah. Last, uh, last one here, Luke, can you sing us five seconds of the BC fight song? Uh, for Boston, for Boston, we put our proud reframe. There you go. Beautiful. Right. Thank you so much for your time, Luke. We really appreciate it. Sure. Thank, Thank you for having that. me on, fellas. I appreciate it. And, uh, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure and go bills and let's right. hopefully talk again in the playoffs. If they, if they, if they make a run to the Super Bowl, you know, please, please come back. and. We'll, oh we'll, my we'll, God. We'll, yeah, I, you know, th I'm just thinking about that in Arizona. I mean, that, that Super Bowl would be 95-5. Uh, the Bills fans. Absolutely. Because there's so many in Arizona to begin with. I mean, it's yep. just, that'd be wild. That'd be wild. All right, Luke. Thanks again. Good luck, guys. Take it easy. Take it. All right, Don. We're going to uh, jump right into the wheel of failed Bills coaches with a special treat today. I uh, feel it's kind of timely. It's pretty amazing that the random wheel fell on Sean Kugler, who was the offensive line coach of the Arizona Cardinals up until last weekend. So amazing coincidence that the wheel ended there. So I was thinking your thoughts, okay. Lockport guy, local guy. Uh, that was my first thing. I, I do remember um, when, when he came in, I think he had been with the Steelers. And I, I was told I was picking up Sean Kugler, taking him to his apartment. Okay. And I remember the first time I saw him, I'm like, I even told him, I said, you are like cut out to be the offensive line coach. You, you just had the – the prototypical look, you know, okay. big ball. Like he just, uh, um, and then I found out that his wife went to Houghton. I actually knew her. She, she was, uh, I want to say she was a senior when I was a freshman. Okay. I didn't know her really, but then I looked, I found a picture. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember seeing her. Um, and then, yeah, so <laughs> I, I still don't know what. What really he got in trouble in Mexico. He got in trouble in Mexico. And he got sent home from the, the, yeah. the game last week in yeah. Mexico City, apparent, uh, allegedly yeah, they roping there. a woman or okay. something I happened. I didn't even know that. I just – I didn't even want to know things like that. You're right. The, the wheel, the wheel, the wheel. The wheel <laughs> plays no favors, Don. The wheel plays no favors. The wheel is cold here. The wheel, yeah. the wheel is strictly about business. Oh, man. So he uh, – yeah, it, it reminds me of um, another coach. I won't say his name, but uh, when we went to London in 2016 – we had one coach get a little um, 
after a few drinks, um, they, they we went a week early. Okay. So they served drinks on, on the way there. Do you have a bye week the week before? No, it was going to be the next week. Okay, got yeah. it. Okay, so this one he had a few too many, and he got a little too flirtatious with with the, uh, the and, and he he got in trouble. Uh, you know, Rex let him know. You know, one strike, a second strike, you're gone. It wasn't it, nothing physical. Okay, but but just to sure. Oh, so I know I'm not talking. That's about a recipe. Sean Cooler, those but, those, yeah. those international trips are a recipe for some some. I mean, you've got a lot of personalities yeah. and egos and i mean the guy uh the the vike it was the vikings offensive coordinator um got arrested for dwi on the way back from the the when they went to berlin not not the Vikings. uh huh. just last week apparently they won came back and probably drinking on the plane well, uh, which yeah. they all did you yeah. know especially the coaches in first right. class i remember them all having their little you know, shot glasses and all the yep. rest. So yep. those long flights and the maybe recipe, more than yeah. more than one night overnight in an international city is a recipe for for uh, you know yeah. trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if the rules are you know for you to be to have a curfew, which they didn't for coaches in London, but anyway, yeah. No, I remember Sean. I, I liked him a lot. I, I uh, you know I heard about this incident, but I didn't even know exactly what happened it's just that it's 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 uh it was a bad look we'll uh we'll move on from the wheel and <laughs> thank you for thank yeah. you for not punching me there so no, listen i agreed to this even though i don't like the failed coaches deal i don't understand by the criteria of having made the playoffs in the playoff drought okay. i know that you right. uh you wanted to share uh let you know this the past uh saturday was the was the probably the biggest college game of the year, Michigan and Ohio State. And yeah. You told me right away you had a story, and then I have a, a follow-up yeah. story that'll make you laugh. So, yeah, I was. Uh, we were at an establishment in downtown Buffalo. Um, resurgence, pretty cool. Um, plug there. But I saw that the game was going to be, and it was Friday night, and it said tomorrow, big Ohio State-Michigan uh, game. And it, it reminded me of, in 2006, uh, when they played, they were both undefeated in one and two. Mm -hmm. Well, Beckler died, like, Two nights before mm -hmm. that, Ohio State offered to, to postpone the game. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. very generous. So, but they played the game. Uh, we, as the Bills, were going to Houston to play the Texans. Okay, so we had a road game, and uh, Nate Clements was was a big uh, Ohio State alum, and he asked the team to reserve a room at the hotel so the whole team could watch the game together. Uh, okay, so there was like. Um, he was one of, I think, three or four. That uh, Dante Whitner was okay, there. Yeah. Uh, Tim Anderson, I think. Any uh, any Michigan alums? One. Okay. One. I felt so bad. It was Anthony Thomas. Okay. And it was for some reason uh, the room was pro Ohio State, and poor Anthony Thomas was just kind of oh. taking it all every time. There was tough. food. And, there was no drinking. Sure. But it was just like you know, every time Ohio State scored, they look at Anthony Thomas, like, what's he supposed to do? Right. But, you know, the game was close. I don't remember what it was. But Michigan, Ohio State won 42-39. 42, 42 yeah. oh, oh, my gosh. Great game. I didn't remember it was. So I, I don't know if Nate Clements would have done this anyway. We had a, we won the game in Houston. Actually, it was, it was a strange game. It was one of the strangest stat lines you'll ever see. Looks like a misprint, but J.P. Lossman maybe had his only good game as a bill. Oh. In the first quarter, he had two 83 yard touchdown passes to Lee Evans. I remember that. Number 83. Yeah. That's, it looks like a misplay. Right. First quarter. Like, that's and funny. then he used to took the lead, and then he hit Peerless Price in the back of the end zone. We won. Um, on the way home, Nate Clements, we, the, you always get food. Bill Harpel used to make sure the team always had food. You come out of the locker room, you get a, a pizza, a full pizza. Okay. <laughs> and they don't discriminate between, you got to watch yourself. It's always funny to watch. Uh, and then on the plane, you get dinner. <laughs> So he, you know, by dinner usually it's like a, a glorified TV dinner, but it's a healthy, you know, steak and potatoes okay. and everything. Really good. You remember? You try. You know, I do. I do. We didn't, we didn't get the pizza. No. No. Oh, okay. No, we got the, nothing until we got on ooh. the plane. Wow. The, bo the box, the box lunch or dinner was on tables as you walked up the stairs. Okay. So I didn't eat. You got a box lunch though. Maybe it just wasn't pizza. It wasn't always pizza. No, no, no. We got nothing until we got to the plane. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So the whole bus ride home. No, no. I I made sure I ate before the game because because yeah. it was it was a long time before wow. we. Ate. Well, on this particular day, Nate Clements had somebody there, the family that lived in Houston, and they said, "Hey, we're gonna make your post game meal." Oh boy, on the plane, and it was like um, 
this spicy stew. <laughs> it was good. It smelled good. For the whole it, team? For the whole team. Oh, wow. Okay. So what was supposed to happen was there was this between the back section where most of the players were uh, and the front section where the staff, the coaches, trainers, doctors were. Um, there was like a little, barely real tight, but it was like a little buffet. Okay. And you go up and you got your own. It was yeah. tons, like trays and trays and trays. Well, it was, it was taking a long time. So some of the uh, flight attendants that would have otherwise been serving the meal thought we might as well serve this to people. So okay. they put, I remember they, they would put a full bowl together and they were walking down the aisle and this one guy had, I mean, it was steaming hot. You yeah. See, he tripped oh, shit. Oh. and, and it went <laughs> forward and um, Matt Missouri, he was a brother of Jeff Missouri, who they brought on for extra help for uh, the equipment. <laughs> it hit him. I saw the whole thing. It landed on the back of his head. Scalding. Sc oh, oh, yeah. And he had just had no idea. And all of a sudden, he was like, ah. Oh, and he has dress clothes on, too. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> and it just, so the whole flight, he had to sit there oh. with all the stuff seeping down the back That's of his head. That's awful. It, it, <laughs> oh. I just, it's funny, all those things tied together. But the Michigan Ohio State game was the start of the whole. That's yeah. funny. So so that leads me one place before then my Michigan State, Ohio, uh, Michigan Ohio State story. Um, Lori Phillips, mm -hmm. lovely wife of, of coach Wade. Uh, I went over to their house for dinner, uh, the one night and she made this, she's from Louisiana, very thick accent. She made this gumbo. Um, it was amazing, but it was one of those that you paid the price a few <laughs> hours later. Uh, it was okay. amazing. It was yeah. thick. It was, it was yeah. so good. And I had like way more than I should have. <laughs> and I was also trying to, you know, suck up to coach and sure. tell his wife how wonderful her food was. And I was, I would have eaten a bowl of shit at that meal <laughs> yes. if it came down to so it. Good. But I, but yeah, but I did, I, I genuinely liked it. But then a few hours later, it was just, it was so like spicy and Southern. Were you and still at the house when this hit you? No, 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 no. Luckily I had gotten back home and I paid the price later. <laughs> So that's good. anyways, that's my, good. my, my Michigan, Ohio state story, same, same year, ironically, 2006, huh. um, I was with my dad and I've mentioned my dad a few times on this podcast. My dad went to a real small college in New Hampshire called St. Anselm's, which is famous for basically probably only one reason. They always host the first presidential debate hmm. of typically when there's three, okay. they always host the first like presidential debate after the primaries are over. So the actual national presidential debate. Mm -hmm. The first one's always at St. Anselm's College in New Hampshire. St. Anselm's was a small Catholic university. Oh. Their sister school is Notre Dame. Okay. St. Anselm's had no sports programs. So my dad, you know, he, he had some mental health issues and some challenges throughout his life. And he kind of adopted Notre Dame as like his alma mater without actually going. Because, you know, Notre Dame, the football program, the tradition, Catholic, you know, it was God's school. It was a connection, though. Enough absolutely. 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 So, so he became obsessed with Notre Dame football. Just obsessed. So it's 2006, and my buddy Steve Bennett, uh, sportscasters, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were, we were going to go to a Buffalo Wild Wings to watch Michigan-Ohio State. And I convinced my dad to go, which was pretty rare because usually he'd want to watch the Notre Dame game at home in his bunker. Now, Sanctuary, the, yes. the 2006 yes. Notre Dame squad, coached by Charlie Weiss, was not great. And it was they were wrapping up the season. They were playing Army at noon, same day. Okay. I convinced my dad, hey, you know, come to come. We'll eat some wings. We'll have a good time. You know, he liked he liked my friend Steve. So we get to Wild Wings about 11:30 in the morning. This is the biggest Michigan Ohio State game in history. Okay. Rightfully, it's on the big screen. Well, my father did not agree with the manager's choice of which game should be on the big screen. He <laughs> threw a fit that Notre Dame Army was not the <laughs> Notre Dame Army, okay, was not the featured game oh. at Buffalo Wild Wings with the sound on, and <laughs> and so it's eleven forty-five, and they grudgingly put Notre Dame Army on one of the. Now this is pre. HD TVs like everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so the main projection TV was HD. Oh, there was gosh. probably a couple. They gave Notre Dame Army one of those to be generous, like the TV cart at your school, <laughs> big yeah. old rear projection yeah. box TVs. It 20, was something. But... Twenty-seven inches hung in the corner. My dad threw a fit. He's like, I can't stay here. So I literally, I had to drive him home and come back to watch <laughs> Michigan Ohio State because my dad. 
A, couldn't watch Notre Dame Army on, on such an unworthy television. Were you able to explain to him why the restaurant did it? It was pretty easy. I was able to articulate it. He, <laughs> he still didn't see. No, no, there was no debate in this. He, he was he was personally offended by this man <laughs> and his choice to put now and, and there were also 30 or 40 people there like in Ohio State or Michigan gear so it was very I mean, it was a no breaker of course it was but one just, and two, I don't have to tell you this was, one and two it was, it was they're both undefeated it was the most ridiculous <laughs> stance you have it was so ridiculous uh, that it just you know <laughs> you know rest in peace to my dad I love yes, him yes. I love his passion for Notre Dame and, and it's carried on to me and, and, I, and I support them you know in his honor but this was this was indefensible oh, <laughs> this was this was a tough yeah. this was a tough ass I know you love your Notre Dame too but you obviously just saw the big picture absolutely there yeah. was no debate there was but so I, I I took him home I missed like the first 20 minutes of Michigan Ohio State mm -hmm. and to the manager's credit the Notre Dame Army game stayed in the corner <laughs> even after my dad like, probably out of fear that he might come back and and, and, and a bad review and harassed the guy. <laughs> so I don't know that the the the, the yeah. manager at, at Wild Wings, but he was a pretty good. So I, I went up to him after my dad went home and I, I apologized and I said, "Hey, listen, here's the situation." And he was very gracious. Yeah. And he said, "We get people like that all the time that are just irrational about their team, whether they're good or bad." So oh, yes. you know, Funny. why don't we talk a little bit about the 1990 Bills and then you know where we're going to kind of go from here? Um, that was good. Uh, 1990 Bills, yeah. Uh, here we go again. Um, they were uh, tied with uh, Miami. Yeah, going into but, week twelve. Going yep. into week twelve, but uh, having you know technically in second place by virtue of having uh, lost in Miami early in the season. Sound yeah, familiar? Kind of, kind of, kind of odd. How I think people would recognize them as the better team. So you know, so far then and now, now both, both in ninety. They were better than Miami, but in second place. Oh, yeah, I'm with you. And that, in yeah. 2022, I think I think most rational people would view the Vegas views them as, as better than Miami. Yes. Now, yeah. but in second place. So so the season is 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 kind of back to trending towards right there. the 1990 season. Yeah. Uh, we are going to go live on Friday morning uh, after the Bills New England game. Works for me. We'll talk about you know obviously what happened the night before. The Bills do take. The big L in 1990 in Houston. Second loss at Houston. Their it's house of horrors in the Houston Astrodome was not. They won the game in '89, right? No, '89 uh, they won. Yeah, they won in '89. It was a shootout. That was right? the, the overtime game. Yeah, and then they lost in '90, and then they lost the, the the week before the comeback game in '92, where Jim Kelly got hurt. Oh yeah, that place. You just always felt that was one place they were going to lose. Right? Yeah, when they played in Houston, you no. just always felt they were going to lose. It was, a, it was a close game. It, it's one you could kind of accept, and it, you know. And I'm not hurting them. And ironically because... enough, the 2022 team is playing in the Bills' house of horrors yes. over the last 20 years. Well, not for this regime, but still, yes. If you know, you stretch did, did, it out. Did you ever win there? Yeah, once. Oh, um, when Brady didn't play. Brady, it was we shut him out. So it doesn't count. We, no, we did. We we it was Jacoby Brissett, and we had a shutout. We got a game ball for it. Rex gave us all a game ball for it, mm. which. Felt a little empty. I mean, it's nice, I, I, but it's like getting a division champs ring if you lose <laughs> yeah. like the next round. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of. I mean, shut out. Congratulations, yeah, you beat Jacoby percent. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it felt good, but it, it just wasn't the ultimate. Yeah. You want to pick your country? Time for countries that should be getting our podcast here. I'm going to go with India. Yeah, okay, oh, that's a lot okay. of people. When I uh, was let go with the Bills, uh, I was picked up by a um, startup company. Um, Garfield Fisher and Carmen and uh, a nice lady named Shambhavi Pandir. Okay. And I was the person that um, uh, helped. We, we were, I was knocking on doors of sports teams. I had a lot of NFL teams that I knew, had friends that worked there, decision makers. And um, so she was the sweetest lady. And, you know, she was trying to play catch up. She was from India. NFL football was mm. a brand yeah. new, completely thing. So in regards to terminology, um, I had to really help her along. Like, I, I wish I had some examples of, you know, uh, hey, the match coming up. Sure. And, and, you know, it was all soccer. And, and uh, but, oh, my gosh, uh, she, she it was funny. And she was able to laugh at herself learning. And she was a fast learner. She, she ended up, she's now a, a big NFL fan and uh, hoping that uh, the company, uh, COVID hurt us hard, but it, it we're, we're they're they're doing great things, and we'll see what happens there. But in honor of Shambhavi, I'm I'm going to go with India. Little known fact, I am I am I'm a, a, a semi legend in India for my rental properties, and I would say over the years I've probably 
rented to at least 150 international graduate students from India. Is that right? My favorite student of all time, who I still speak to, and I actually spoke to on Thanksgiving uh, during the Bills game, his name is Bidlab. I just, my last name was like Bhattacharya, some, some long 16 letter name. Sure, close. And um, super great guy, came to the country, uh, came into one of my properties, uh, stayed there for five years. We became friends. He quickly learned about football. Mm-hmm. I learned about soccer from him. Mm-hmm. Uh, we <clears throat> shared many beers over both. Uh, he actually moved to central uh, Pennsylvania, met a girl, um, and has a, a great job now, and it was able to stay in the country. Um, and so he, he's a big Bills fan now. Excellent. Uh, and that kind of ties into, into my country. Okay. Um, tomorrow, USA against Iran. You're going to pick Iran here? Well, yes, of course I'm going to pick Iran. Really? Yes, of course, because... For the, for the freedom-loving people. <laughs> Listen, first right. of all, well, first, of all first of all, isn't, okay. isn't always the theory that the more, um, you know, the more media, the more American, uh, you know, things that they're able to, 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 to hear yes. and to share with each other, the more they might want to be like, and what would be more American than our podcast? Like, <laughs> okay, if, I see where you're going with it. Are, I like you know, that. You know, it's, yes. like, it's, like, it's like the voice of America that went over the Iron Curtain, right? <laughs> yeah. Or don't, don't right. they broadcast into Cuba? Don't they have like, you know, there's always the messages Yep. And you know, in World War II, you know, there was always the the, the propaganda. Not to say that we're propaganda, yep. but you know, they were. You're always trying to you know win the psychological war yeah, against your opponents. War, warfare. So sure. for, when the U.S. beats Iran tomorrow okay. in the World Cup, which I I, I hope and I think they will, mm-hmm. I think that the Iranian people might want to soothe themselves with our podcast. I yes, I can see that. What would be now. more? What would be more like like what would be what would be more soothing than listening? To you know, Luke Russert, Michigan, Ohio State talk, <laughs> and the wheel of failed Bills coaches, right. which might prompt you know a revolution in Iran. Who knows? Who knows? All right. So I'm going to we'll go with Iran. Iran. I right. knew Iran. I knew I would get a, a quizzical look from you. Uh, well, you explained it well. I I, I know where you ended up. There. I like. That. Well, thank you. Yeah. So we <laughs> will uh, sure. we will we will we will be live on YouTube on Friday, uh, either at 11 a.m. or noon, somewhere around there. Right. Uh, hopefully, everybody who listens to this will be able to check that out. Looking forward to it. Go Bills. I want to bid you now farewell, but not goodbye. Thank you very much, Ralph. Today is a, is a bittersweet day for me. Uh, memories, many of which which Mr. Wilson has alluded to um, flood my mind right now. I'm surrounded by my thoughts and uh, indeed by the presence of uh, friends unparalleled. Visions from a lifetime of thrills keep flashing before me and yet the uh, future beckons and I look forward to it with excitement and anticipation. Because I'll tell you something, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. So I advanced it on that. And we finally, we finally came to an agreement and decided to move forward. And so now my time with the Buffalo Bills, in my opinion, has come to its natural conclusion. Uh, how do I begin? to thank all those who have been instrumental in enriching my life here. (laughs) Well, I can't do it adequately, and I know it. I can't adequately. But I remember you all, fondly and forever. Jordan, Fox, on an early day, be sure you get your taping and breakfast in. The meeting tomorrow for all players will be an 8 a.m. meeting. Enjoy your day today, fellas. It's great because it was a special group of people uh, at a special time in the city. The team that we had really unified the region. And there are still people who think fondly of those things and remember some significant things that happened during that time that were, that were pretty cool. 